on Business Incorporated today. Fuel prices persist in Kenya amidst preparation for August general elections. Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa partners United States Department of Agriculture to boost food production. And smallholder farmers in Rwanda now in charge of the largest tea factory. Hello, welcome to the program. This is Business Incorporated. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Well, we start with trading figures as usual uh, on the African continent. Uh, Midweek trading was mostly negative at intraday. Nigeria's main index was the sole gainer. It rose marginally 0.03%, while South Africa's benchmark index dropped 0.83%. And all this happened at intraday. Elsewhere, Egypt's index also traded lower 0.09%, while the Nairobi Stock Exchange closed yesterday's trade positive almost 1%. We move over to the Middle East now, where sentiments were mixed at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index fell 0.33%, while Dubai edged up 0.2%. And still within that region, Saudi Arabia's index dipped by 0.66% at intraday, and Qatari index climbed by more than half a percent. Let's go to Europe now. Pressure for an EU oil embargo on Russia is growing. Now, some of the members uh, of a Germany's governing coalition are saying that it should happen sooner than later. Or well, we have to give us the details. Stephen Bursley joining us from Berlin. Hello, Stephen. Are we seeing a change of heart in Germany when we talk about the Russian oil and its embargo? I think what we're seeing is that the scales are gradually tipping. Now, what we're talking about in this case is three prominent legislators, uh, each representing one of the parties that's in the three-party coalition that's governing Germany right now. So these are high-ranking members um, of the coalition. And what they're asking for, basically, is a sped-up timetable for getting rid of Russian oil, for stopping Russian oil imports. As it stands now, the German government has said that by year's end, they should be able to stop those imports. Uh, these three members made these comments after a visit to Ukraine. Uh, they visited the West, and they said that surely that timeline can be sped up. Now, one of the members, uh, the Green Party member, Anton uh, Hallfreiter, said that he would like to see it even sped up further, um, that there should be not much of a transition period, uh, that that transition period from moving to, uh, from, from implementing a stop to actually beginning it uh, could be very short, a matter of weeks, he said. That's, of course, a reference to the recent de decision on the EU level to quit Russian coal. Uh, there's actually been a long transition time built in there. It's not going to happen until August. That on the wishes of Germany. So there is some acknowledgement that these transition times can also um, be a hurdle, even when you do make that decision to quit the fuel itself. Um, at the same time, it's worth pointing out that there are still um, those who are very reluctant to put in place an oil embargo. That is still the status quo here. And one of the reasons is because of rising prices. They are uh, rising fast and consumers are feeling it here. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, apart from that, well, one of the consequences of that is inflation. Tell us about uh, the figures from Germany. Yeah, again, this is one of the reasons why there is reluctance around the, the idea of embargo, embargoing f further fuels uh, from Russia. Uh, what we saw yesterday released by the uh, the federal government here, 7.3% increase in costs from a year earlier for March. Um, that's also an increase over last month, February. Um, so prices are going up. It's being felt. It's largely driven by energy. So by uh, performing more of those or by, by implementing more of those energy embargoes, um, if the price of oil goes up higher, if the price of gas uh, spikes as well, then you're going to see those prices go up even further. So there is naturally a concern. There's a belief that um, that uh, some of these measures are, in fact, fueling um, more protests around uh, the EU that we're seeing right now in places like Greece. We're also seeing that more populist candidates are finding support on this message of rising costs. Uh, if you look in France, for example, the election coming up in two weeks, um, Marine Le Pen, the populist candidate, has really uh, made a lot of hay on um, really focusing on rising prices and how difficult that is for consumers. And uh, what are the market figures telling us about all of this? 
Right, European markets taking a dip at the beginning, looking at that new inflation, uh, those new inflation numbers out of the U.S. Inflation there reaching a four-decade high. That, of course, has a ripple effect throughout the globe. It's likely now, even more likely, that the Federal Reserve will tighten its monetary policies in the U.S., and that as well has a ripple effect uh, for global markets. So we expect to see them down today. There's also new data out of China uh, that points even more to a possible slowdown there as many of those lockdowns take place. So that's also going to weigh on markets today. Yeah, it sure will. Stephen, thank you so much for that uh, update and enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, talking about inflation, households in Britain have come under renewed pressure from the soaring cost of living after the official inflation rate reached 7% last month. I know Juliana talked uh, about this with Ladi in the morning. Well, it seems we can't get away from this conversation. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. So how much of this uh, surge in inflation is connected to the Russian invasion in Ukraine? Good afternoon, Idi. I would say uh, a lot of it. We know that we were already seeing an upward trajectory of inflation before uh, Putin's uh, war um, in Ukraine, which started on February the 24th. But this has certainly um, added more upward pressure. If we look at the cost of fuel, which we know has uh, been spiraling out of control over the past uh, a couple of weeks, that um, is up 9.4% in March. That was one of the significant um, upward pressures, which is why um, inflation is at um, 7%. And it's not just that. There are other areas. I think anybody uh, watching the show uh, from the UK will see the pinch. Um, I was saying to Laddie this morning, and I'll repeat it again today, it, the, the headline figure is 7%, but if you are buying a coffee or trying to eat um, at a restaurant, it does feel like 50%. Everything is getting significantly higher. And the problem is, Innie, it is just going to get worse, unfortunately, because again, as we do with this data, we're looking in the rearview mirror, aren't we? We're not looking at what's happening today. And the difference between March and April is is the hike in national insurance tax, as well as uh, the 50% hike um, in energy bills. So it's coming at 7%. Some economists predict, project that it could get to about 8.5% next month. And fingers crossed for families in the UK, that could be the peak until, of course, we start raising prices again in October when that energy uh, regulator uh, uh, price cap is lifted yet again. So now I think all attention is going to be on the central bank, the Bank of England, they are gathering again in May. Um, we got interest rates now at 0.75%. We're expecting that to be lifted by at least uh, 0.25 basis points uh, to 1%, which is a way of curbing inflation. But then, of course, for those on mortgages, not fixed term mortgages with credit cards and everything else, a lift in interest rates also is a lift in your payments. So it's a pretty much a lose-lose situation at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, a picture there that really calls for concern, but I guess it, it's, it's where we are in the world at this time. And how's the market receiving this inflation news and the impact? Uh, not great, although it's a mixed bag, as we said, um, from yesterday, following on today, really disappointing uh, data from the Office for National Statistics on inflation. But the FTSE All Share at intraday is down 0.02%. Uh, the FTSE 100 is up by 0.10%. And uh, the FTSE 250 is down by 0.60%. In the currencies market, the British pound is up on the US dollar by 0.01%, also up on the euro uh, by that same amount, and up on the Japanese yen too by 0.51%. Worth mentioning, Innie, that one of the biggest fallers uh, today on the FTSE is Tesco, the grocer. Even though they have tripled their profits in the past six months, they've uh, uh, given a pretty stark warning to investors that not only is consumer demand changing, because, of course, restrictions have been lifted. People are not at home scoffing themselves. They're getting out and about. But supply chain problems still do loom. And, of course, the cost of living. A lot of people cutting back on some luxury uh, uh, roast chicken, uh, shall we say, and getting the cheaper one. And of course, that has a dent in profits. <laughs> yeah, these are the realities of our times. Thank you so much, Juliana. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Annie. Let's move to the US now, where stock features were higher in early trade as Wall Street tried to recover from a downbeat session following the release of the inflation we just talked about. Features on the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.4%. S&P 500 features and Nasdaq 100 features climbed 0.5% and 0.6% respectively. 
Well, those moves come after the S&P 500 and Nasdaq posted their third straight losing session. Data released yesterday showed consumer prices was up 8.5% in March from the previous year, the highest level since 1981. And this further fuels concerns of tighter monetary policy from the Federal Reserve. But well, we have our correspondent, Maria Bird, now joining us with uh, details from Tuesday's trading. The U.S. stock market closed on a downward slope on Tuesday as the Dow Jones was down 0.25%. The S&P 500 was down 0.34%, and the heavy tech NASDAQ composite was down 0.3%. It is clear that inflation is having a major impact on the U.S. economy. Many are watching to see how the Federal Reserve will begin to correct and decrease inflation. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Moving to Asia now, shares in Asia Pacific were mixed also as investors watched for market reaction to the release of Chinese trade data. And New Zealand also hiked its rate by 50 basis points. That's the biggest increase in more than 20 years. Mainland Chinese Shanghai composes slipped 0.82% and it closed at over 3,000, while the Shenzhen components dropped 1.6% to 11,568 11 Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index rose about 0.1%. That was as of the final hour of trading. And data released today shows that Chinese export is rising more than expected. It, wrote, it did that in March. Chinese dollar denominated exports grew by 14.7% year on year. That's according to official customs data, and that's above what was expected. Elsewhere, the Nikkei 225 in Japan jumped 1.93% on the day to 26,843.49, while the topics index advanced 1.42% to 1,890.06. South Korea's cost rose 1.86%, closing at 2,700. 1,716.49, while the S&P X200 in Australia edge higher, 0.34%. MCSI's Brodex Index of Asia-Pacific stocks outside Japan gained about 0.6%. Oil space now prices edge higher on Wednesday after Moscow said that peace talks with Ukraine had hit a dead end on that field, supply worries, while weak economic data from China and Japan kept a lid on gains. Brent crude rose 48 cents to $105.12 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude features gained 28 cents to $100.88 a barrel. Crude features are also drawing support from Russian oil and gas condensate production that fell below 10 million barrels per day on Monday. That's the lowest since 2020 July. The International Energy Agency I said that it's expected Russian oil output losses to average 1.5 million barrels per day in April, with losses growing to close to 3 million barrels per day from next month. Price gains, however, were kept in check by weak data from China and from Japan. In a metals market now, gold firm near a one-month peak today as the Russia-Ukraine conflict boosted bullion safe haven demand while investors also bought it as a cushion against soaring inflation. Spot gold was up 0.5% at $1,975.45 per ounce, and after hitting $1,978.21 yesterday, that's the highest since mid-March. U.S. gold features were up 0.2% at $1,978.90. But safe haven bids uh, due to Ukraine crisis and inflation concerns are supporting gold, and could continue to do so, as uh, some analysts are saying that adding prices could revisit $2,000 an ounce in the next few days. Spot silver gained a 1.1% to $25.63 per ounce, while platinum rose 1.7% to $982.11, while palladium advanced 2.5% to $2,000. $382.92. We'll take a break now. When we come back on Business Incorporated, we have stories from the African continent. Do stay with us. Welcome back Just to watching Business Incorporated on Channels Television, where this August, tens of millions of Africans, Kenyans, We'll turn the attention to Kenya's general election 
And Kenya's recent history features hotly contested, sometimes violent elections in which candidates and their allies have used tribal politics to turn people against one another. Well, for many Kenyans, this is the mother of all elections. The country's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, of the Jubilee Party has overseen an economy battered by inflation, debt, and even dealing with the current bill crisis. Well, we have a business correspondent in Nairobi, Mercy Melanoi, joining us now to bring us up to date. Hi, Mercy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ini. Yeah. What's the update with the fuel crisis? Well, um, it has been quite an issue. We have been having um, a bit of lack of fuel um, for the last one and a half weeks. And of course, this whole issue began um, when there was um, a whole debate uh, between the oil marketers who are in charge of importing um, oil to the country together with the government. Now, during the COVID, when COVID hit, um, of course, the whole, the whole world, and of course, the first case was reported in Kenya, the government took certain initiatives to make, it, to make life a bit easier for Kenyans. And one of the things is they introduced subsidies and one of the subsidies was for fuel. Now the oil marketers um, who import oil now claim that the government has not been paying subsidies. The subsidies were about 5%. And of course, they've been meeting these extra costs that the government has not been meeting. Now that tiff between the oil marketers and the government has now led to this particular crisis. And of course, there are claims that the oil marketers um, are holding oil because already the government um, already assured Kenyans and it is confirmed that yes, there is oil. And of course now until that is, until the subsidy but also um, last week we saw the president signing off um, an agreement that this has, he signed off an agreement um, with the Treasury um, to release some funds um, to be able to cater for to cater for this subsidy and of course um, to to open up to the oil marketers to now release the oil. But now here comes another issue. Um, as that tomorrow the energy regulator um, will be releasing new um, new monthly prices, which is always on 14th of every month. Now what is happening is that also there is a claim that oil marketers are um, still holding on to the oil until the new prices are announced so what so this has left Kenyans at a very tricky position because now people are queuing and um, the long queues in the petrol stations now Kenyans are even going to buy oil with jerry cans so it has been quite a tricky situation here for the past almost one and a half weeks and also for Kenyans are just hoping that this this issue will be resolved because when the president um signed off um to to release funds to these oil marketers to meet the subsidy uh, to meet the subsidy that was that was still owed to the oil marketers we thought that Probably this will end even as of this week, but we have not seen the same and still the very long lines on in petrol stations. And the worst still, you know, there is Easter coming up. So people are still fueling yeah, so and trying to fuel as much as they can because of their coming travels. Exactly. Yes, so, so Mercy, um, Mercy. It's so, quite issue. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, uh, looking at the, the factors and the param economic parameters at this time, it is not possible to say that there will be a reduction in the price of the petrol that you're expecting tomorrow. Obviously, it will be more. Is the government saying that they're going to sustain the subsidy or has, it, has the subsidy regime come to an end? The subsidy is still there. The issue was the government has not been meeting the cost of the subsidy because if you say that you're giving Kenyans a 5% subsidy, the government is supposed to meet that 5% cost to the oil marketers, which the oil marketers have been meeting. But um, we saw the president signing off. We are yet to know whether they've been paid the subsidy or not. That's still we are yet to know. But for the claims that are going on is that probably the oil marketers are waiting tomorrow for the prices to go higher because they claim that the oil that is already at the port of Mombasa that has been imported, they imported it at a higher price. So they cannot sell it at the same price that we've been buying fuel um, for, the, for the past one month. So we are still waiting. Well, of course, we are, we are looking to see what the regulator will do. Probably they may, they may maintain the price. They may increase the price. But as of now, um, Kenyans are really fueling fast so that in case the price increases which we're hearing might increase even by 40 shillings which will be wow. quite a lot yeah. and many kenyans may not be able to afford that so kenyans are rushing to fuel before they announce wow. the new prices oh wow well well just before we let you go we're almost out of time now election is coming up in august 
and business operators are saying it, it looks like there's no more governance or there's been a reduction of governance now. It's more politicking, close to, uh, I think, what we have in Nigeria at the moment. Well, actually, this will be, this is said to be one of the most contested um, elections. Normally at a time like this, we would have already been seeing who might take over, who might not. But as of now, we don't, it's even difficult to know. So it's a quite highly um, contended elections. And as of now, you know, um, the previous, I don't know, the previous um, uh, opposition, um, opposition leader, Raila Odinga, right now is, had did a handshake with the government. So as of now, we are sort of functioning with sort of no opposition to, you know, to question government on some of these things mm -hmm. that are happening, like the cost of fuel. But um, for businesses, we are just hoping that the, the, the effects of elections and of course the activities may not affect the businesses a lot because as of now, even businesses are still recovering from COVID. So the business community is really hoping that first it will be a peaceful elections. We mm -hmm. won't have a back and forth um, going to court to contest for elections results because as it is already, businesses are still just recovering and they cannot handle one more crisis. All right, uh, Mercy, thank you so much for the update. We certainly wish you guys the best, especially with the field and with the election. And we do hope we feel that it will be a peaceful one. Thank you so much, Mercy. Thank you, Ni. So moving on now, uh, we see that uh, Ethiopia Airlines, the largest aviation group, in Africa has announced the resumption of thrice weekly passenger flights to Bengaluru. That's India's commercial capital. The airline announced the recommencement of it after it halted operations for two days. And in other stories now, um, Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which is an organization that seeks to transform African agriculture from a subsistence model to strong businesses, has uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with the United States Department of Agriculture, and it's to enhance the agricultural transformation in Africa to create jobs, boost trade, strengthen resilience, and transform economies. And uh, in Rwanda, small-scale farmers have become the new owners of the country's biggest tea factory. The 5,000 smallholder farmers and their umbrella investments a vehicle, Molindi Tea Company, are the new owners of Molindi Factory. It's uh, once the biggest supplier of tea in the country. They were handed the factory by the Wood and Gatsby Foundations, uh, both British. The foundations handed over the factory to the farmers uh, that they've been holding since 2012. A lot of support has been given to the farmers through finances, technology, and management. And uh, just before we go, we have this story just coming in that the statistician general of the Federation is dead, uh, Simon Harry. He died this morning in Abuja. He was appointed by the president, President Muhammad Buhari, in August 2021 to replace uh, Mr. Yemi Kali as the statistician general of the Federation. Uh, is, uh, there were stories over the weekend, but that was debunked. It's now been confirmed that Mr. Simon Harry is dead, and we do wish him uh, rest in the Lord. So that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Ini John McFarland.